Thanks, I really appreciate it. Um, before we get started, I just wanted to say, I'm yeah, I'm a core team member for Vue.js, and we work on a project called The Cookbook. That was just released very recently, so check it out. Um, we also just refactored all of the components page, so we broke it up into sections. So if you wanna, if you looked at it before and it was too much of a long streaming thing, uh, go check it out again. Cool, all right. I know it's the last talk of the day, but we're gonna do a lot of cool stuff, okay? Um, all right, serverless functions and Vue.js. So how many of you can predict the future? Are there any Bitcoin millionaires in the house or like early Apple investors? Couple, all right, I'll talk to you after. Um, <laughs> for the rest of us, when we launch an app, what happens? Well, in your best case scenario, after you're done jumping around in formal wear, uh, your best case scenario, you immediately have to scale your server. And I think we'd like to all think we look like this during that process, like we've got a dope hoodie on, an unbranded computer and our, we're so good at programming that our fingers are literally on fire um, but we probably look a little bit more like this we're wearing your sister's rain jacket and we're trying to find the Q key and even when we do that we're not sure if it will help us exit them um, <laughs> Or what about the more likely scenario that you didn't exactly fail, but you didn't get quite as many users out of the gate as you thought? So in that case, you're paying for all of, your, you're <laughs> out of cash and you're paying for all the server space you're not using. John Travolta shows up in your wallet, which is kind of awkward to explain to the VPs. Um, and you could scale down, but what if things can kick up again, right? So. Scaling is a bit of a drag, which brings us to serverless. It's an actually interesting thing with a really clickbaity title. It's true. The first thing that anyone's going to tell you when you talk about serverless is they're going to say, well, you're actually still using servers, which is true. So why call it serverless? The promise of serverless is to spend less time setting up and maintaining a server. So what we're focused on today is the part of serverless architecture that boils down to functions that state when this request comes in, uh, run this code. Um, for this reason, people sometimes refer th to them as functions as a service or FAS. Uh, my name is Sarah Drasner. I'm known as uh, Sarah Edo on Twitter, and I work for Microsoft. Eh? Eh? <laughs> Uh, as mentioned before, I work for CSS Tricks too. I'm a staff writer there, and I also uh, am on the Vue Core team. So why are we talking about serverless? What are some of the benefits? The benefits include, but are not limited to, um, some of the situations we talked about before. You're not scaling and babysitting a server anymore. Um, they're also really reasonably priced. They're actually kind of improperly priced for the consumer. Everybody set things too low, and now they're like competing too low, which is why I like talking about them. <laughs> um, uh, so yeah, we, we spend less time babysitting as for a server. Um, it's kind of the same idea as functional programming too. We're breaking things down into small bits. So if you're writing serverless functions properly, you can actually reuse them for a number of tasks. They don't have to just be for one thing. And something I quite like about them, they kind of use the principle of least power, um, which in computer programming boils down to choosing the least powerful premise suitable for a given purpose. So we mentioned before that serverless can mean functions as a service, and there are a lot of other as-a-service things out there, so I thought I would break down what exactly that means for all of these different types of things. And th this is an actual SVG animation that's open source, so you can check out the code if you want to. Um, so if we have different services, this is infrastructure at a service. We manage everything above the waterline, platform as a service, and functions as a service. You can see you're really only managing your application. Now, when we usually deploy server-side software, we start with a host instance, then we deploy the application within the host. In a serverless paradigm, we remove both and replace it with a vendor fast platform that we don't manage ourselves. So we deploy these functions to the platform, and this allows us to instead focus on the logic written as individual functions. And unlike that earlier host and application model, the function isn't continuously running. When an event is triggered, this is executed by a vendor in a container. So does this mean that we should serverless all the things? No, not really. Serverless is really good for a lot of different use cases, most, some of which we'll cover here today, but it doesn't do well for long-running stuff. So think about like WebSockets. So if you're talking about like 
online chats or mu multiplayer services where people are chatting all the time, like online games or like a real-time social ticker or something. Those are not good for serverless things. Um, so what is it good for? It's really good for cleaning data on a Chrome job. It's really good for taking data and using it to create data visualizations. We're going to do some of that here today. And cropping images um, uploaded by the user to create a user profile, things like that. Um, as mentioned before, I work for Microsoft, so I will be showing things with Azure, but you can totally do all of this stuff in any kind of service as, uh, that you want. I'll even show you the line of code that you'd change if you're using other services. So setting up the, uh, a function is pretty trivial. It will get a free account and go into the portal like this, and we'll have a number of options. I just learned Keynote, so I'm really into those transitions. Um, the <laughs> one thing I want to uh, point out is this consumption plan. That's really important because uh, when we're using the consumption plan, that's the one that scales along with our usage. If we're using the other plan, then we'd actually have to you know, figure it out and manage it and actually scale it. So right away, they set, up a, uh, they set us up with a test, which I've simplified and modified to use tacos, which I think is really important. So here we're passing in a request body, which you can think of a little bit like a, a parameter in a function. Um, and then here you can see where we're actually using that request body. Um, we also have this idea of a context log, which is similar to a console log. Um, so if we run this, You can see everything update, and over here we've got hello delicious tacos, which we, you would probably would assu assume we'd get. And then over in the context, we have that yo 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 yo. So we're we're pl um, we're actually able to see and log and get errors and stuff. So. Uh, now you know how to set up a function. It's just like functions you already know and love, except they're executed on a server. Um, so let's put this no knowledge to some use and a ni nice kind of somewhat common use, and let's do view, stripe, and serverless to set up an e-commerce site. So here's a sample view application that I made. There comes a time in any young app's life when it has to monetize, and there's a lot of ways of monetizing, but certainly accepting money is a good way of making that really direct. Um, so we're going to look at this apl application I built and all of the steps that it took to make it, and then by the end of this next like 10 minutes, you'll know how to set this all up. So since we don't have time to go through every piece of the application, I'm giving you a bird's eye view of the structure so you can see how it's all set up. I'm using Nuxt, which you just saw a presentation for, and Vuex. Um, so you can see our store over here. We're going to communicate with Stripe and also our serverless function. Um, anything in this pages directory is like a dot view component, but it will actually turn into a page like you saw um, uh, one of the Chopin brothers showing you earlier today. So eventually all of this will talk talk to our serverless function, and that will communicate with Stripe on the server. So let's do the lowest hanging fruit first, which will be the Stripe. Um, and we can set it up with just a few clicks. So you create your account, and once you confirm your email, you go to the sidebar, and in the dashboard, you'll click API. And this will show you your testing keys, and they're all set up for you. So when you visit the Stripe documentation, they'll give you this code that uh, wants you to execute on the server with the use of Express. You can see how we would use this to create a customer, and then we pass in the Stripe charges, the amount, and some details. But we're already executing on the server, so where we, we're going, we don't need Express. So how about that? All right. So. What we'll do to make this work, um, we're just going to go through a few different chunks. We'll add in our Stripe testing key, and then we'll use that module.exports uh, to kick off a, a serverless function in Azure. If you're using other services, that's the line of code that you'd change. So here we're still creating the customer with their email and token, and then we're passing in the amount and details. And then we'll finish everything up, provide some error logs. You'll note I log a lot. That's so that if anything goes wrong, I know how to track it down. And now when we execute our function in the test panel, uh, when we execute our function in the test panel, we'll pass in what we're eventually going to get from the client. So a testing token, an email, and some base charge. And you can see all of those context logs printing out and showing how our function did. 
And it was a success. If we go back to the Stripe portal, you can see that the function went through and we're already starting to log some testing Stripe customers. So one piece that I'm not going to show here today, um, but you can check out from this CSS Tricks article, is how to host this all on GitHub if you don't want to use the portal. Um, that's pretty easy to do. Uh, that post will show you how. So now we've got one side done. We have to connect things to our serverless function and our app. So first we'll talk about that Vuex store and that cart.view page. So that Vuex store and our cart.view page. All of our products are in a big manifest object in our Vuex store. We're storing what's in the cart as well as the cart total. So you can see here as I add items, our Vuex store updates. So again, Vuex is a little bit like Redux, and these, uh, this is the Vue dev tools if you haven't seen them before. So here's the shape of what we're going to build on that cart.view page. First, if there are empty items in the cart, we'll add them to our checkout component. Then if the cart is empty, we'll give them the ability to get back to the main page and add some items. And finally, if there's a success, we'll let people know it's being processed and we'll add a success component. So let's look at that first code block. If we have items in our cart, we'll show a cart that kind of reminds them of what they're purchasing. So a thumbnail, a quantity, and its price. And if you don't know what those uh, kind of pipes with the US dollar, those are filters in view. I'm basically formatting currency. So here's what that will look like. And we'll get the total uh, by getting values in our cart and creating a computed property here. Um, but now we're showing what's in the cart. We've got to build out that actual checkout so that they can purchase what's there. So here's what we'll eventually have. The cart, a place for your email, and your credit card. And the easiest possible way to add Stripe to your page is a component called View Stripe Checkout. I've linked up the re repo here. It's literally a button that you throw on the page and a Stripe modal appears. It's easy as pie to implement. But if you notice on our site, we actually had a checkout form that was embedded in the page and styled along with the rest of our page. For that kind of customization, we'll use a thing called Stripe Elements. They're a little bit more work to implement, not so much, uh, but they allow you the freedom of handling the form yourself and making it fully integrated with your site. So this version of uh, Stripe Elements Plus is the one that I found that works the best, so you can install it either with NPM or Yarn. And now that we're going over that cart.view page, we're also going to integrate a checkout.view component. This is where we're going to use those Stripe elements. Out of the box, here's what we get. The component has a few defaults. A couple of notable things here. You can see that those XXXXX is where we're going to put our Stripe testing key. And there's a at click pay, which we'll call a pay method. That's a pretty important part of this. So we'll keep that in mind as we go forward. In the script, in the same component, we have some imports. You can see at the bottom here that pay method. So create token returns a promise which resolves in an object with a token or error key. Now to configure it for our needs, we're going to have to store some data properties, including whether it was submitted, whether it was completed, the status, and the success. We'll also need to gather a bit of information from our cart.view component, which is the parent. We'll need the total as well as the success. And then when someone clicks that button, remember we, we talked about that pay method. So we're going to use Axios here, and we're going to talk to our serverless function with that Axios call. And we're going to send everything that we need. We're going to send the form, our token, our email, and the total. And in case you're wondering where I got that, you see that post URL here? In case you're wondering where I got that, if I go back to the portal, uh, there's this get function URL right in the side there. That's what we're going to use to communicate with that. After it's complete, we'll change the set status to success, clear the cart uh, with a mutation in Vuex, and log any errors. So to review, because this is probably the most important part, that pay method, in it, what we did was use Axios to post our function to our function URL, track whether or not we've submitted the form or not with this.submitted. It sends the email, token, and total to our serverless function. If it's successful, we commit to our Vuex store. Mutation clears the cart. It emits the parent cart component that the payment was successful. And if it errors, it sets the status to failure and logs the error response. 
we don't really know how long it's going to take different users to talk to that function, especially if they're in different areas of the world, we might have a lot of latency. So while the function's working our magic, we'll show them this SVG loader I made that's a few seconds long, and it's kind of long enough to draw attention and re uh, reduce the perceived wait time for the user. If you're curious what I mean by perceived wait time, I have like a whole nother talk on that. That's a story for another day. <laughs> in the case of failure, I feel really bad for this cat, oh my goodness. Um, <laughs> we'll let them know that something didn't quite work and we'll clear out anything that's set by that payment but not the cart yet. In the case of success, <laughs> we'll show a little successful animation that gets that dopamine flowing, we'll wait a bit and we'll reset the cart so that they can continue shopping if they wanna buy more items. So then it loads, and there's the success. So here's where we are now. That success is actually a component of its own. It's still attached to the cart page. And it looks like this. I made a code pen demo for you if you want to check out the code in isolation. We, um, we've created a set timeout event, and we restart the cart with a function on the parent emitted from here. So I kind of like that you know, UX flow of like once it's done, you can then go shopping again. But you could do this any number of ways. So okay, remember this view? Let's fill out what we did. We created our cart, imported our checkout component, and it also tracks a successful payment. If the cart was empty, we let them fill it up by going back to the home page. And if the payment was successful, we show a success component, restart the cart on a set timeout, and clear out what we have. All right, you did it, party. All right, that wasn't so hard. You did an entire checkout component and process with serverless functions and Stripe and Vue in like, you know, 10 minutes. Awesome. Um, all of this code is open source, the function and all of the application. If you're making a real life application, there's probably a couple steps that you need to do also with like testing. Um, uh, but you know, this is pretty much there. So uh, go check out the code and have a party. Cool. Okay, we have about 10 minutes left. We're going to keep it really short and sweet for this one. Um, in the time that we have left, I mentioned that you can use a function to fetch data for a beautiful front-end visualization powered by Vue, so let's check that out. Um, so as I mentioned before, I work as for Microsoft as a developer advocate, and people often ask where my team is speaking and when. So I made this demo using 3JS, serverless function, a library in Vue, so that people can explore where we're going. Here I'm executing a serverless function to gather geolocation data for that globe based on where we're speaking and the frequency of the location. So every time I commit to master in GitHub and that Vuex store changes, then it will go and fetch that geolocation data for me because I'm super lazy and I don't want to go fill out those fields by myself. <laughs> um, so here's what we start with. We start with this big JSON blob that I basically got because I asked my coworkers to fill out an Excel spreadsheet of where we are and where we're going. So I download that to JSON and I all of a sudden have my Vuex store. But I don't have the latitude and longitude, which is I, what I need to make that globe. So the cool part is you already know how to make a serverless function. Um, they, al uh, they already have a default for a GitHub webhook in the Azure portal. So we're going to use this to kick everything off. So here we're going to retrieve geolocation, geo information for each item in the original data. And not shown here will error if it doesn't go well. And given an array of entries wrapped in an iterator, we'll walk through each one of them and populate the latitude and longitude using the Google Maps API. And notice we'll also cache locations to try to save some API calls. And after this, we'll check the cache and see if we've already looked up the location as well, which isn't shown here. So now you can see our function at work. It's taking all of the locations in our GitHub file, and you can see it's updating all of them, and it's updating it directly in our Vuex store. So we don't have to go back and forth or anything. It's going to execute and fire and clean up all that data immediately. And the nice thing about this is since it's all on the server, uh, we know that we're not fetching all of this information on the client and making our app really slow. So anytime we commit to master, this is what happens. All of a sudden, all of these entries get populated with latitude and longitude. Then here, remember how we were 
uh, filtering that table as we typed, we're going to use a computed property for them. So if you're not familiar with Vue already, computed properties are really important to understand because they're really powerful. They're calculations that will be uh, cached based on their dependencies and only updated when needed. So they're ex extremely performant when used well. Computed properties aren't like methods, even though they kind of look like methods. They're actually used more like data. So you can kind of consider them a new view into your data. So if you notice, I called that filtered data right here. Now we're going to display the table using filtered data. So you can see in that T body, uh, TR, V4, post, I, and filtered data. So filtered data is what we're using, and that will become our computed property that's filtered on every keystroke. So here you can see it in action. We select a conference, and you can see how fast that all updates. I'm not using a library for that or anything. I'm just using a computed property to filter all of those entries. And as you might have noticed in that globe, we need a pin for each latitude and longitude. But that's not all we're doing. We have to make it longer for repeat instances. So we'll check if the location exists. If it does, we'll increment it. If not, we'll create new values for them. And we use the data in this format to feed into our globe visualization. So to work with 3JS, we have to mount it into the DOM on a single element. Um, the code to create the globe is kind of large, so I actually use a mixin and split it into different parts so I can bring in pieces of it. Another thing to note if you do start working with 3JS is I found if I load the texture and mount it and then pass it in an, into a parameter when I call it, it actually runs a little bit faster. So that's just a note to be wary of. And not that you'd want to do this, but because Vue and 3JS play so nicely together, we can update the appearance of this globe in one line of code and change it from a sphere to an icosahedron or what have you. So we can create myriad projects with Vue and 3JS, and the world of data visualization is totally our oyster. Serverless and Vue allow us to accomplish a lot without a lot of infrastructure. It's really cool how these technologies play so well together and allow us to accomplish a variety of tasks so quickly. I hope this gets you started pairing Vue and serverless technologies in the future. Thank you.